Welcome, everyone. Welcome. <laughs> I'm excited about this night. How about you? Yeah. <laughs> How many people were not here last night? Can I see your hands? Wow, I'm so glad you made it. Amen. How many people, this is the first time you've heard me speak? Um, how many have heard me on YouTube but not in person? How many people never heard me speak before? Thank you, Jesus. Help them all. I was never made to be normal. I'm one of 15. I'm number three. That means I was a mother at age eight. Because I was a helper. If you never were part of a big family, a tribe, you don't understand that. If you were, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You pretty much never had a life. That was your life. You learned uh, at a young age to surrender. You learned how to be in charge. You know how to, uh, to break up fights. <laughs> to bring peace. Be adventurous and exciting with the things you have them do to keep them busy so they weren't fighting. How to feed that many people, how to make that much food, how to wash that many dishes, 150 every day. Peel 50 pounds of potato once a week. Eight loads of laundry a day. I think we did like 60 a week. I helped with all of it. <laughs> And so I learned at an early age to hear God for help. <laughs> My baby sister sitting on the front row is number 15. I was like a second mom to her. So we grew up knowing each other really well. She lives with me, has lived with me since 1999. And so has my mom because my dad decided to go home to heaven. He's having a wonderful time up there on his ranch with all of our pets. It's too late to tell me they don't go there. It's the father's choice. And there's some things only he decides. And if he decides to do it, who's going to argue? It's too late. They're there. I recognized many of my pets I had even when I was like seven. You know, much before that, not a lot. But ever since that time, all the... All the pets I've ever had, I've recognized all of them. And many of my siblings' pets they had. My brother Joey's duck named Max when he was nine. My brother's alligator named Charlie that lived in our bathtub until it was bath time. My brother's iguana lizard named Iggy lived under the downstairs closet, which was also our phone booth. You know, in the 50s and 60s, you had one phone with one line, and it was hooked to the wall. And sometimes it was a party line. That doesn't mean it was a party. It means you shared everybody's conversation with whoever they were talking to until they were done. Unless you could convince them you really needed the phone. So I grew up in the time and the era before microwaves at the very beginning of television when you had a round screen that was black and white and they had five shows. Not a lot to watch, right? We had a big old house, we had a big yard, and all of our friends wanted to come and visit us, so that means we had probably had 30, around 30 all the time in our yard. And so we learned how to get along with the rest of the world just because we had to grow up together. Amen. Uh, my father knew God well, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit very well. So did his mother, some seventh generation of knowing God living for him, loving for him, and I love everyone. Amen. No matter the mistakes you make, even what you believe, I know where you came from. Oh, you came from him. He had plans for everyone. Not everyone chose his plans. Many people don't even know him, but he wants to know them. So I have a lot of grace, and I have unending patience long-suffering and patience in my life so I can put up with just about anything all the time. And God needed me to be that way if I was going to share his home to people all over the world. Yeah. No matter what I would have thought about them, I changed. 
I changed several times in my life. I got more and more like God because we're supposed to be just like him. I actually began to say that. There was nothing else to do except say it. So I used to stand there and say, God, I want to be just like you. Now, if you loved your father, would you say that about him? My brothers used to say that about my earthly father. I want to be just like you, Dad. I said that about my heavenly father. I want to be just like you. I'm going to talk like you. I want to act like you. I want people to see you when they see me. I want them to hear you when they hear me. And I want to crush darkness. <laughs> and so one day, I was just minding my own business, which is God's business. I was speaking in a church. I also speak in many other places. Anyone who wants to hear about heaven, they'll invite me. They, they have to get past the pink hair. Whoever knew that that would be a stumbling block, right? I've been the same I'm the same as far as my relationship with God uh, since I was age four. That's a very long time, 62 years. I've known Jesus Christ personally. And so, you know, I knew he was watching my life all the time. I mean, he does live in us, right? right. He's not blind, but he still loves us. He has hope for us. And uh, he has a lot of hope for us because Christ in us is the hope of so if he lives in you, you're not going to escape carrying it. And that means one day you'll shine like the stars in the heavens because the word says so. So before the one day I was going to tell you about, there was another time. I was in another city and um, I think we're on fairgrounds or something. I don't remember. We had to go to the ladies' room. There were no lights. All the lights had blown out and that was a problem. So I went in there to see what was going on. When I walked in the door, it was this long, big room, and it was dark until I opened the door, and then there was light. So I started looking for the light. I'm literally looking, where's the light coming from? I'm not kidding about any of this. I went, where's the light coming from? None of the lights are on, but everywhere I looked, there was light until I looked in the mirror. It was coming from me. <laughs> I was... Stunned. <laughs> but it was, it, was, it was overwhelming to me that I was seeing the word alive in me. But when you begin to declare things about God or for God, those things are going to start happening in your life. And I would tell people all the time, one day you'll shine like the stars in the heavens because he does. Let me tell you, he shines. I'm talking about Jesus Christ. He's got so much glory coming from him. He can dim that glory if he wants to, but I've seen him full out glory like a million diamonds. And I used to be so undone whenever I would see him. And so I'm stand, still standing in the ladies' bathroom when there's no light anywhere except coming from me. And I went, this is crazy. So I still thought, well, I know I can see it in the mirror, but let's look in all the stalls. So I opened every, do every door and there was darkness till I went in, then there was light. And I walked up and down. Then it was fun. I went up and down everywhere in there. And there was light everywhere. And I thought, if somebody needs to come in here now, <laughs> while the light's on, <laughs> while the light's shining right now, you can see whatever you need to do. And so uh, these were just like, I would call them random um, encounters or instances that happened to me uh, most of my life. But that was one that really surprised even me. And... Uh, I heard the Lord say, did I not say you would shine like the stars in the heavens, that even the night would be light round about you? And he was just saying the word to me, and he was confirming the word. And so if you're faithful to him, he's going to be faithful to you. And I know everyone's been through hard times or they have issues in their life or things that they're facing that might not be easy. Remember who he is. And remember who you are. Yes. Yes. Okay? If you begin to remember who you are, according to the word, you change the way you look at everything. And sometimes nothing seems impossible. I've been in a lot of impossible uh, places in my life, and it never touched me. I made a decision I'm not changing according to circumstances or what people think or what people say, or what is actually happening. I, I don't let any of it affect me. Because my hope is in him. Yeah. That's right. 
My eternity is in him. No man holds my eternity in their hands. It's in his hands. And I told people one time when we had absolutely nothing and slept on people's floors, that wasn't to teach us something. That was to show others something. That no matter where you are, you can carry the glory, you can shift things, change things by the decisions you make and the choices you make every day of your life. It doesn't stop you from ruling and reigning from Christ. It doesn't take away your authority. And I, I told somebody one time, they're saying, well, how are you holding up? I went, what am I, what am I holding up? What are you talking about? Well, you know all the things you're going through. I went, I'm not going through anything. I'm living my life for Christ. No matter what's going on, I will move things. I will not let things move me. Yeah. Now I began to declare the goodness of God over my life, over my family's life, because I knew this was a very short thing in my life. I knew it wasn't the devil. How about that one? It was God showing people that you can live powerfully no matter what's going on around you. And by the decisions you choose, it can change things. I didn't change anything I did about my church. I still served. I helped. What I had, I would give. I love people anyway. I was rejoicing every day of my life. I chose to be happy. That's good. Yeah. That's so good. And we were sitting with a friend, sleeping on their floors. And uh, it was my daughter's uh, fifth birthday. And you know what? She was happy about anything because she had lived with us. We, we trained our children to know God himself, to know who he is, what his plans are for us. Yeah. And she just, all she wanted was a little baby doll, carriage and a baby doll. And we couldn't get any of that at the time because things had been, something had been taken from us. It wasn't us doing it. We didn't even curse the person. And so there was a, a, a sound outside the front door. She was awake. She ran to the front door and outside was a brand new, <laughs> with a big bow on it. The most beautiful baby doll carriage I've seen in my life and the most beautiful baby I've seen full of accessories in this beautiful carriage from someone who knew nothing about what was going on. And she ran out saying, look, my present has arrived. <laughs> the angels brought it. <laughs> and, uh, and so we celebrated her birthday. It was awesome. The next year, before the next year ended, Someone walked up to us and said, here, take this and live here free for a year. It was a million-dollar condo out at one of the most exclusive places in our city at the beach. We didn't call this person. We didn't tell them anything. We lived the same way every day if we'd already been living in that place. Because we trusted God. We knew he held our future in his hands, and I refused to let the enemy have any fun. No, I tormented him the entire time. That's right. That's right. Because all I ever did was have a good report. I had a God report right. of what God was saying about us. Amen. Amen. So no matter what it looks like, start worshiping him, declaring who he is, who holds your future in his hand. Amen. Amen. Because we're entering into powerful times on this earth. I've been talking about this for a while, but things are literally starting to happen that I said even 12 years ago, literally happening exactly the way God told me they would happen. And I'm here especially to do two things. Um, I'm going to talk about Trump. I hope you like him. I hope you realize God does not always choose the one we think is better. He chooses the one who is the best for what he needs. Even my own mom, if she was here, she'd come up and give her testimony. My mom's a hoot. Yes, she is. She's 80 something. I forget how old she is all the time. She calls people who are 69 old. But she never includes herself. She travels all over the world with me on no medication. She has no help to do anything. She's planning to live to be 120. Unless God wants her longer. She'd like to see my dad before then, but she understands he's having a good time, so she's okay with that. But she's very political. And has been most of her life. 
because she knows what is right and what is wrong, and she has a plumb switch to prove it. <laughs> if you'd ever watched any of my, uh, when I campaigned this whole last term before uh, Trump was elected, I had a lot of Trump reports, and my mom wanted to be in as many as she could on my Facebook. She gave her own thoughts and opinions on everything. <laughs> Most of the time, she had her plumb switch with her. People said, we need your mom. My mom did speak her mind, but it was along the lines of what God believed and purposed. She knew what life was. She knew what death was. She didn't have a problem discerning them or telling anyone which one to choose. <laughs> she hasn't changed. And she's still my mom. Even though I'm in my 60s, Jen's in her 40s, our mom is still our mom. And I can probably hear her when she goes to heaven one day, giving me her opinions on things. <laughs> she loves this place. She loves Pastor David and Dee Dee so much. She's getting ready for her next month when we go on our British Isles cruise. She's going to get to, for the very first time, visit the land of her earthly ancestors, which is the Irish. Yeah. She's a good example of an Irish, Irish class, let me tell you what. And she's expecting to have a lot of fun. Amen? Amen? <laughs> so she's getting on her treadmill, getting in shape, picking out her... She's already got her suitcase packed, I think. And so she has a lot of fun when she goes. She will meet 100 new people and call them all her friends. So she still enjoys her life. She starts her own prayer line. Yeah, if people want children, if, they, if they're in a place where they can have babies, okay? Not saying if you can have or not. I'm saying if you want them and you're married, you're going to have one if she prays for you. Yes. We have ev evidence of here, right here in this yes. church. Uh, she prayed for them. I think it was like nine months later. <laughs> Their daughter had a baby. And so my mom is serious. So she'll start a prayer line at meetings. Who would like to have babies? You must be married, because that is coming first. <laughs> and she'll pray for them, and every one of them, as far as we know, every one of them has had a baby that she prayed for. Wow. I mean, she will, she'll make sure you understand what it means to have one, because if anybody knows, it would be her. <laughs> What's going to happen as a baby gets older? This is what you can expect. Uh, don't be shocked when this happens or this happens. It's all going to be okay. All this stuff is normal. You just give your life away for about 10 years. <laughs> and so she's a lot of fun. But um, my mom put a lot in me. My dad put a tremendous amount. My mom put a lot of the practical, logical things that we need to know. Um, how to treat people, how to be polite, how to be a young lady. Because you never knew who you're going to... Make sure you always have clean underwear. Yeah. <laughs> that was always on the list. Yes. Every single day. Yeah. Always do what, Jen? Always wear your seatbelt. Seat or if you're in the car with her, she will put it on you herself. And so she does not want people to break the law. And she reminds us of it 24 hours. <laughs> a day, even if we're not, even in other countries, I'm telling you, she's really on top of things. So she's a lot of fun. My dad was the most amazing person I knew on the earth. And I love to talk about him, but tonight he wants me to talk about Trump. In heaven, they're rooting for him. I don't know what earth people think about. Heaven knows that God picked him and what he's already done for this country proves that God picked him. Amen. And he's going to win in 2020, in case you wonder. Write it down. Write it down. It's going to happen. And he's only through like two years, and he's already created 5 million jobs. If you didn't know, I know all the stats. I have friends who are part of the Trump administration. Um, I don't know him yet, but I will. God said I would. And I'm, you know, when, whenever that happens, it's good with me. But he's got a lot of things planned he hasn't even talked about yet. I'm talking about the president. I did just come from the Trump 2020 uh, announcement rally in Orlando, Florida. 
It was so deafening, you could hardly hear anything from the people. They had 100,000 tickets, but the place only held 20-some thousand people, so everybody else was outside. They had jumbotron set up. And this is the honest truth, no matter what you've heard on the news, there were 35 hecklers. <laughs> 35. Against to the tens of thousands, which, which came to cheer him on and thank him for what he has done. And the thing about the hecklers, because I made sure I, I was outside most of the time on purpose this time. I was over there by them releasing the anointing into every one of them. They needed help. If I was going to be one of them, I would have set up my stand and I would have given our plan. I literally would have said, this is our plan for the Democratic Party. This is what we got planned. It's going to be great. They didn't do that. All they could do was swear at Trump and swear at people. It was really sad. So I was praying all the time, releasing the anointing, sending the host to pull down the demonic off of them. I mean, I was over here having prayer warrior time. They couldn't scream over the sound of the, the jumbo screens, they, they couldn't. Because I was on the corner, like right here's the massive Amway center that was deafening. It was like a wave would come from here, from the jumbotrons, a wave would come from here, and I was being hit by both waves. And I do want to make some statements because I'm a seer. That means I see the spirit realm like I see everybody's angels here. Yeah. Everybody say, thank you, angel, thank you. for putting up with me. Loving me loving and watching you. over me. Watching over me and not making you work. <laughs> not making work as much. <laughs> as much as you want. <laughs> well, I have to tell you one of the exciting points of me being there, and I literally just came from Hollywood from being there for seven days, night and day. I'm going to be part of um, giving content. I was sharing this last night. I literally am um, what I said seven years ago. What God has said to me, I said it happened this last week in Hollywood. Uh, they're drawing up my contract to give spiritual realm content for the Resurrection of Jesus Christ movie that's being made in Hollywood. In Hollywood. So you're going to see the truth on the screen to the entire movie. Like Colossians, where Christ spoiled and messed up the principalities and powers in the midst of hell, ruined their very visage forever, stripped all the royal robes off of Satan, and took the gemstones, every one that God put on him, according to Ezekiel 28. You will see him pluck them off one at a time in the movie, leaving only the mountings that held them. You'll see him take the keys of hell, death, and the grave, while the rest of the all of the hell that was present to watch this show, it was a show. Clearly, the word said, Christ made a show of it openly. So he had a show in hell, wasting hell in front of all of hell, okay? And you will see that in every detail. I can't tell you much more than that, but I will promise you, you will see that in detail while people stand up all of the theater and scream for Jesus Christ. Yeah. <laughs> You'll see the depths of hell where it took place. And the Bible says, all through the Bible, as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days, so will Christ be in the earth. God had a plan. No matter what anyone thought, he had a plan when he sent his son. And on the day he died, which is actually in the garden, when he drank the cup, you will also see what he drank. It won't be a thought in your mind anymore. Because he died in the garden. He died to his own will. He said so. If it's possible, Father, take this cup from me. Because he saw what he knew what was in that cup. Evil. The most worst evil ever. Into his perfectly pure body. Walking as a man, righteous, 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 with no sin. Asked to take that. That is what had to be nailed to the cross. Not just his body. That had to go in this perfect body. That, every sin that could be committed, had to be nailed to the cross. He is the only one who can forgive. Because he's the only one that drank that cup. No one took that inside of themselves and was nailed to the cross. It was what was in him. That he had to drink in that garden. It was God's will. 
And he couldn't even look upon his son. He couldn't hear his father for that time. He said so on the cross. So this will be the most different movie you'll ever see in your life. It will introduce the spirit realm to all of Hollywood and the whole world. So, yes, I am excited because God is taking Hollywood. Amen? You'll see many changes in some of the worst places in our country here uh, because God has always planned to have them for himself. Satan's been ruling in these places for a long time. So he's very much afraid. I will not use the word angry. There's a difference in angry and terrified. He, Satan, is terrified. He can't stop it because God has somebody who's never going to say no, who is not afraid of what the enemy might do. The enemy is afraid of what I might do. Does the word say that? If you submit yourself under the hand of God, you know resist doesn't mean, oh, no, I'm not taking you. I will not tolerate yep. anything you're offering me. I do not serve you. I serve the most high God of heaven and earth. I despise you. I'll never surrender to you. Yep. Don't waste your time. Yeah. Get out. That is how we're supposed to live. Yep. That is a manifested daughter of God. Manifesting his power, his plans, yes. his love, yes. his ways, yes. his will. Right. By the way they live. Yep. It's not something you do every now and then. It is a lifestyle. And there are people, and God made me take years to get to this point so people would know who I am and what I stand for and even how I live. It would be hard for someone to try to bash me because most people wouldn't believe it. Someone sees me the first time, I don't believe you. I think you're lying about everything. Why don't you go ask God? You cannot hear him because you should. If you belong to him, the word says, you will not hear the voice of another. If you want truth, go ask him and pursue him until you hear it. If you give up in two weeks, how can he give you something that's going to take 50 years? Because some things I've been waiting 50 years for. And I will still get it. Because I'm not giving up. And I'm not going to step back. I'll have whatever he wants to give me. And you should be saying the same thing. So Hollywood is going to be wrecked by the Most High God, by the host of heaven. I've been bombarding Hollywood since I left there, sending in sweeps of that place 10 billion host of heaven. To pull down every stronghold of Satan, every realm, any high-level being has been ruling from, they're being shredded. The ones I can't will have their mouth shut while I'm there. Because I don't have to tolerate them. God didn't. Did he? His son didn't. Did he? Are we supposed to be just like them? Are we made in their image yes. and after their likeness, which yes. means the way they operate, we're supposed to operate. Yes. So when the body finally gets that message and they wake up, stand up and stand out, you'll see many powerful changes and shifts happen in this world. There are 10 year olds right now commanding an army of the host of heaven and they've been doing it for three years. They wreak havoc on hell. Yeah. The enemy runs from them. Oh, yeah. This is who we are. We're not weak little humans. Right. We may live in this world, but you are not. You are an alien. That's right. You're from another world. That's right. And God is serious about us living on earth as they live in heaven. 
So this time for America is a great time. It will set things up for many years to come. 24 years of God in the White House will happen. So you can expect Trump to win in 2020 and then Pence win for the next eight years after that. And whoever Pence picks as vice president will be president for eight years, eight years after that. 24 years in the White House, maybe the Democrats should take a long vacation. And wait it out. I'm trying to help them. It is sound advice. You can only talk like this if you've seen God face to face and he told you that. Except he doesn't just tell me, he shows me. When Trump said he was winning, God showed me, took me to Fisher and showed me Trump sitting in the White House. When there's still 17 people in the Republican group running against him, God said, I will eliminate them one by one. They'll be forced to take him. Because even the leaders didn't want him because they couldn't control him. They couldn't scare him. They couldn't buy him. God picked the right person. So I know I don't know who Pence is going to pick, but they will seriously consider it. They've already heard me declare all this on the inaugural prayer breakfast when they let me do the prayer over Trump and Pence. I prophesied. (laughs) So I'm looking forward to these years in my life. Don't miss them. Don't sit on a rock somewhere and just watch it go by. Be a part of it. Because once you step out and start doing something, it just accelerates. Your faith explodes. When you begin to see God do things quickly, because we're in a time of acceleration, it will be quickly. We still have years left. I don't always tell how many years left. I don't know the date and time. I know the event. Like at one point, there'll be, I'm talking about when there's no more time on the earth. I'm not talking about just the millennial reign. I'm talking about past that. Because during the millennial reign, you know that's a thousand years, right? How many people know that? Been to Israel. Been to the temple. I know that Christ will sit on a throne for 1,000 years in that place when no one is destroying Israel. If you wondered about that, don't be concerned about it. Keep praying for them. God is blessing them. The desert is blooming like it never has before. I was there five years ago. It was all desert. When I came this time, because I was also there for like, I forgot how many days. It seemed like eternity. (laughs) I didn't get to speak in a nice hotel. I actually had to do the pilgrimage tour where you went to Masada and uh, every place Jesus went. Then, other, you know, Elijah, you know, on Mount Carmel, I was there. Uh, I was in the garden tomb where the two angels who rolled the stone away are still there. I stood in the garden flower bed where Christ did. That's why Mary thought he was the gardener. He likes flowers. I've been in the upper room. I spoke on the Sea of Galilee. I was in Shiloh where Joshua led the people into the promised land. That's where they first settled. I was there. I saw every spiritual spirit realm thing that had been opened by all these mighty men and women of God. And I think the thing that moved me the most was you could hold a Bible and stand, (laughs) not quite, but it seemed like you see from one end of Israel to the other, it's not very big, but everything in the Bible happened in that small area. And they have kept those places. They've kept them. And they they like Americans, but Israel loves Trump. They love him because in a short amount of time, what he was able to do for that country that's never been done before. It was actually promised by many presidents in our country, but they never did it. He did it. And they all love him. It doesn't matter how old they are. It doesn't matter if they're Orthodox or, you know, Messianic or secular Jews. It doesn't matter. They all love him. 
because he's made their country safer. He's finally announced it is literally a real country. Amen? Yeah. It had the right to that land. They got the Golan Heights back. You got to go everywhere in this country because Americans are welcomed by anybody. It doesn't matter if it's Palestinians. It doesn't matter who it is. Syrians, if they live in that country, they kind of separate up the land. Israel smart. They don't have as much war because they sat down and talked to these people. Well, they own all the land the Palestinians aren't, but they made an agreement. We'll let you live there, but you'll pay taxes. Instead of having a war, instead of keep fighting, why don't we all live our lives? So they don't go in their area without permission, but everybody gets along. And so all these different sections, I think it's like ABC or something, like they came up with a plan. I was amazed at the plan, but, but the American tourists can go to any part of Israel they want to because those people know they're going to make money. So they welcome tourists all the time. It's like they won't let an Israeli bus driver go into one area, but they'll let a bus driver from that area pick up the Americans and bring them in that area. And so that's why there's not as much war. Also, the threat that Trump said, if you attack them, you're attacking me and my country. I think that helps a little bit. God purposed for them to be friends. And this is a season of destiny for Israel. It's a season of destiny for Korea, for England, yes. amen? amen, of course, for America and Hollywood. Four priority things God has pinpointed to start something between 2018 and the end of 2019. Major things would happen in each one of those places that would set them on a course for their destiny. And God made sure I got to go to each one of those places and declare something for him. And uh, Korea was the first one. At the end of the, right at the end of the games, I was invited to speak to a university. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> With my 12th grade education. See my graduation certificate. They wanted me to come teach them about heaven and give college credits for it. Wow. <laughs> and they all did very well. <laughs> That was quite interesting. I lost 12 pounds because I don't like fish. Guess what they ate every day of their life? I had pretzels, Brazil nuts, and oranges. That's what I ate for 12 days. In Israel, it was almost the same. I didn't like their food either. Guess what they eat a lot of? Fish. <laughs> the whole hotel smelled like fish. So I ate like um, tomatoes, a roll. I again had some kind of nuts. I think it was almonds or something. I ate almonds. And every now and then I have some little dessert thing. That was about it. So I lost 12 pounds there also. <laughs> if you go to Israel, make sure you're in pretty good shape. Because you will climb up everything. Steps made out of stone. Steps that go forever. And then you're going to come back down. There's no trolley car to take down, okay? You walk up these steps, down these steps, up these mountains, down these mountains. Sometimes inside the mountains. But you walk. You're going to walk. Those people walk. No wonder they're all in good shape. Don't ride a camel. Don't walk by one either. <laughs> My heart went out to the wise men as they crossed the desert for two years, each with a bunch of camels. It wasn't three camels with three wise men. <laughs> My whole life, I thought, wow, they had a long journey together. Must have got each other, know each other really well, right? It's just the three of them. No, they each had lines of camels. And they carried their tents, their food, their food for the camels, their water, their servants, their homes. They carried everything with the smelly camels. <laughs> and thinking, I have a whole new view of being on that caravan. <laughs> so some of it was funny. Most of it was very powerful as I got to meet some really uh, amazing Jewish people. They took us into the Jewish quarter. We had a really great... Um, 
tour guide. His name is Yoshi. If you ever plan to go there, look him up. They call him the unofficial mayor of tourism. He also is in his 70s. He's been in, um, I forgot, three different digs. Actually, where they unearth stuff and everything, he knows a lot about that. Takes you into the old Roman places before Christ was even born. And you see a lot, learn a lot. But the thing that you never get over is the presence of God there. Yeah, that's right. And you're so impacted by you realize how they live their lives. Yeah. And yet they have survived, survived, survived. And they have outlived all of their enemies, <coughs> which they are very pleased with. Yeah. And they'll always make the statement, no matter what went on. They're gone. <laughs> and we are still here. <laughs> so God does have uh, amazing plans. He really does have priority lists he's working on. And he's going to complete his priority list. It's important to pray. Always pray. Never stop praying. Make sure you declare and decree also. It is a high level of praying. And when we pray, many times we're asking, which is good because you don't have it, right? If you don't ask. You have not because you ask not. Asking comes in a form of the prayer we've used to be been doing on most of our lives. Declaring and decreeing is another level of prayer where you have so much faith in you. You know what you say is going to happen because you know the word, what the word says, and your faith grows as you step out and believe and trust God more and do things. You, you become so full of God and you understand the word comes so alive to you because you're living it. You're not just reading, you're living it. And so God does have a timeline in heaven. I was shown that timeline. I've been to heaven so many times I lost count. I stopped counting. But I remember every time I've been. He has a timeline behind his throne. And I've seen part of that timeline, and there's still a lot left that hasn't happened. And every one of those things I saw was not like a date. It wasn't like March 2nd, 2019. It was the name of the event that was going to take place. And there's still things we haven't done that the word talks about. So I know there are people literally writing books and sharing from their platform. It's all, all going to end. Well, they've been saying that a long time. The Mayans lost out. They had their last chance. They're all dead and gone. And we're still here. So the Mayans timeline, that's gone. That was actually written down. And people said, well, we don't have much time left. I went... I'll still be here, and it'll all be gone. I'm not going anywhere yet. And so God has his timeline, and there are events. We're living in one of those events right now that he calls the kingdom age. And in this time frame of this kingdom age, which is several generations of time, uh, it, is, it is going to uh, not end until the millennial age starts. Amen? Amen. Or right before the millennial age, possibly. I don't know when that's going to end or happen either. I just know it's not for right now. The perilous times are not for right now. This is the day of his power, not the day of his wrath. The most important thing you can learn about God is what time is it? That's why the tribe of Judah wouldn't do anything without consulting the tribe of Issachar, who knew the times and seasons of God, how to operate in it, what you needed to operate in it, what you needed to do to be successful in it. And the manifested sons and daughters will operate just like the tribe of Issachar in this time. They will know what time it is on God's timeline and how to live the way you need to to be successful. So living on earth as it is in heaven is very important to know that and to actually live it to believe in God, let your faith explode in him, be prepared to celebrate, not to escape. Forget escaping. I love it. I love what the Father says. You've gone too far. You can't go back. It's too late to escape being great. That's what he thinks about this time. It's a time to be great for him, great with him. Amen? Even if you don't understand anything I'm saying, trust me, it's not over. How about that one? So roll up your rapture rug. Don't worry about escaping because the rapture won't be an escape. It will be a celebration. So even that's not going to be what most people think. We have to escape. We have to, we have to escape the mark of the beast. I don't think he's on the earth yet. You know why? He won't be able to do much. 
Because in this time, we get stronger and greater with God. We manifest the power of the living God and do things so shocking that it will stun hell, push darkness back, and shift this world and change things. The Antichrist couldn't be here. It says clearly in the word, until he that is withheld is removed, the Antichrist cannot appear. And we're just finding out who we are. So forget about the rest of the stuff. That is in the Father's hands. Jesus said to occupy until he comes back, not hide. We also get to put the third show on. God put the first one on. Kicking Satan out of heaven with all of his fallen angels who were angry and bitter at their newfound leader who lied to them. The first thing he said to them was a lie. Everything after that has been a lie. He even lied to them when Christ went into hell, remember, because he had to. He was telling them he's going to wipe up hell with them. Get ready, we're going to have a show. Oh, I'm putting on the biggest show. He said, I'm going to wipe him up, and people are going to know finally once and for all, I have more power, I have more authority, this is my area, my area, my realm, I rule here, and no one's going to come in here and tell me what to do, and yet he beat him up. How many people saw the Avengers and saw the Hulk? <laughs> Take Loki. Bam, 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 bam. Yeah. Pretty much that's what's going to happen in the movie. I love what Jen says. Iron Man shows up first in Jesus. This is not, this is a, this is a fictional account, okay? <laughs> Taking some license in this. Because Jesus did melt the faces of the principalities. They melted like wax. So there's Iron Man. <laughs> and then... To the leader of all these that he had taken so much time to call in because principalities don't sit in hell. If you understood how hell operated, you would understand how much that scripture, what that means in that scripture when it says the principalities and powers, he wasted them and spoiled them. Well, they wouldn't even be in hell normally. They rule on thrones around this world. Because Satan was going to have a big show, he called them all in. All that word went everywhere. Call them in, call them in. I want them to watch. Put them on the front row at the gates of hell right inside the courtyard. They're going to see me, man. I'm all stoked. I'm going to go get my royal robes on. No, he's, he, no, shine his stones that at that time he still had. I got to shine them so they, you know, they glow. Remember he fell because of his beauty. He's about to lose it all. He had the keys. I'm in charge of death. This was him. He actually said these words. He bragged about it on purpose. So here comes all the hierarchy. All the little demons have to be way in the back, screaming and complaining, whining. Why are these big guys coming here? They, they all hate each other, by the way. There's no love in Satan's care. So he's going to have a good show. And all this time, Christ is saying nothing. Just waiting for his father to say something or hear something. Third day. Lightning bolt hits hell. Right when the show is going to start. You know, in order to have a show, you have to have lights. You got to have action. You have drama. You got to have a lot of noise. And somebody recording it all. Oh, don't forget the audience. Got to have the audience. So Satan had it all planned out from his master table where he had planned all this out, right? Figured God didn't come the first day. God wasn't, didn't know where he was. He wasn't smart enough. Didn't come the second day. He was afraid he wasn't strong enough. So now we're moving him from the back of hell up here. We're going to put on a show. That did not happen. Not the way they planned. So when that happened, there was a little shudder in hell. They remember the lightning bolt. That's what took him out of heaven. That was the father's only thing he had to do with the whole show. It was his son's. Stands up, and the fire of God comes out of his hands and begins to melt one by one. The little guys in the back row were really glad they weren't. They were glad they weren't on the front row. There's a big opening towards the back of hell from the courtyard. They were trying to cram themselves. They were running so fast, screaming, trying to get away from the son of God, melting everything. 
literally running down this, this darkened tunnel. They were screaming and you know, running on top of each other. They didn't even care the principalities were getting the, the front row. <laughs> and then he melts half the faces of all of them. Some of them managed to get away. When I was a little girl, I would see them. When I went, into, went places, I'd see these demons. Their heads were like this big. They were this thick. Their eye sockets were melted. Their mouths were disfigured and melted. And I would stand there and go, I wonder what happened to them. What, what happened to them? I don't think hell can melt their own demons. I mean, I didn't really know until I was taken back in time and I was shown it. Now I understand completely. I don't know why you're showing me this, God, but I'm enjoying every moment of it. Until <laughs> I got the call from the producer saying, I'm going to make a resurrection movie. You want me to give me spiritual content? I'm like, I know why I saw that. <laughs> and trust me, they want it in the movie. <laughs> he is not afraid of what any man's going to say. He's waited 15 years to do this film. Wow. And he doesn't care. He's a businessman. Okay? He says it's easier to work with business people than religious people because if it doesn't line up with everybody's doctrine, they don't want it. And they'll crucify you if you put it in there. And they said, no, don't put it in there. He's ignoring every one of them. Wow. I waited 15 years to do this movie. I'm doing it God's way. I want what God wants. And I don't care what anybody says. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? So I'm very excited about this whole thing because the world will finally know Jesus Christ is the Son of God, not a good prophet. So God informed me several years ago that I'm going to put a third show on, but I won't be doing it. You will. It's for the sons and daughters. That's why the earth cries out, for them to stand up and do something. Yeah. He said, I did the first show, my son the second show. You all get to do the third one. Lights, action, drama, lots of yelling. Raising the dead that were cremated. I'm serious. But if you go to a funeral and he says, get up there and take the lid off that jar and you command that spirit to come back in that body, are you going to do it? Yes. You should say that very loudly. Because yes. trust me, if he says that to you, you are going to know it is a son of God. Yes. You're not in your head going to even have, there's no time to even argue with that when he says something. You get so like, empowered, you're like, shh. Take the lid off the jar. I command your spirit to come back into that body in Jesus' name. And all the ashes come out like a whirlwind, and there's the person. That is part of the third show. Stopping earthquakes and then telling them to put it back the way it was before they happened. We are over the earth. We are over the ocean. We are over all of the atmosphere, over every creature on this earth. We have authority and dominion over them. We're just finally going to demonstrate it. So don't ask me, where is that in the word? I just told you. It's Genesis 1.26. And in Romans, where it talks about the manifested sons and daughters, that is you. Don't wait for some great name person to come stand somewhere and do it. Because right. stuff's going to happen everywhere. And who's going to do something about it? We are with Jesus Christ. Right. Don't think I'm too old. He doesn't care if you're 99 or 9. If he picked you, he picked you. And you can sit there in your seats all you want to and say, I don't want to do that. It won't work. He has this wonderful, powerful way about himself <laughs> to influence you and convince you, especially if he comes in person. You're going to go, and you're going to think you're going to melt into the ground when those eyes that blaze with passion for you look in you and say, but I need you to do this. You're going to run over top of everybody you know. 
You're not gonna care what one person says. You're not gonna be very quiet, by the way. <laughs> Practice yelling. <laughs> People go, well, I'm quiet. I went, you won't be quiet on that day. I was a person who never spoke. I was happy never speaking to anybody. I think I spoke to two kids, people in high school. I wasn't trying to be a part of anything. I didn't care. I had a tribe. They spoke all the time. I didn't need to hear someone else talking. I was the person who never, I was the wallflower, the one who never wanted to say anything. I didn't want to hug people. I had enough people hugging me at home. If I didn't want to hug people, I cared about them. You know, God help them. I did help them, my dad did, so I helped my, helped my dad help people. But still, I was a person who never wanted to be known. I would have never had pink hair on my head. I like my long blonde hair. I didn't ask for pink hair. Jesus Christ came in person, sat on my love seat at 4 a.m., put his arm around me until I thought my body was gonna melt into his. It began to tell me what my destiny was. This is after they've been taking me to heaven since 1996. Now he tells me the other side of the story. And then he looks at me and he goes, and we need you to have pink highlights in your hair. I didn't dare voice anything. Who was going to tell the Lord of glory? I don't want to do that. And then, but in my head, I'm thinking, Why? You know why? My daughter's going to get married in two months. The in-laws already think I'm strange. <laughs> All it would take was walk down the aisle with pink hair on my head. <laughs> he knows every thought you're thinking. And he looks at me and puts his arm on your daughter because he goes, it is absolutely necessary that when the world sees you and they hear you, and they know you know us, but you love, and you have pink hair, you're never gonna judge them. They'll listen to anything you say. We need that pink hair, it's heaven's marketing plan. I'm sure there's not a pastor on this earth that ever thought God would use pink hair as a marketing plan. I've met some of them. For four years, I served so many pastors at different events in my city, loved them, they knew me so well, but I had gone over the deep end when I had pink hair put on my head. I went, y'all, y'all need to get more of the spirit in you. Because you could discern. You know, know me by the spirit, not the, not the flesh, right? It's a flesh test. And just get ready if he ask you to have green hair. I would encourage you to go get it because he has a purpose for it. And I've been trying to explain ever since I've had this, since 2006, I've had pink hair. I've won more people to the Lord than I had my entire life before that. It works. Amen. Just stand somewhere. If you're over 50, someone's going to come and ask you, <laughs> what is that? Well, I'm heaven's ambassador. They have hair like this in heaven. And then I start talking about the things they like because Jesus is telling me, and the Holy Spirit is telling me the whole time I'm standing in front of them, talk about, the, talk about the extreme sports in heaven. I was talking to two teenage girls on the beach. I think Jen was there. Yeah. They had skateboards with them. But, you know, a skateboard's a skateboard, right? So I start talking about extreme sports in heaven where you don't even need a helmet. You do 100-foot jumps. And your skateboard's got fire coming out of it. Yeah. And they drop their skateboards. It's like 14. What are you talking about? I was told there wasn't a God. Oh, no, I've met him. I've been to his home called Heaven. And you would not believe the things I have there. And did you know he made you? And did you know you lived in him before you came here? They don't care about any doctrine. They've only heard God hates them because they're sinners. They've only been told about hell, not God. So I talked to them for 40 minutes. They're so filled, so excited about God. They wanted to know where they could go. They wanted to give themselves to him. They wanted to know, where can I go that I can hear this stuff? I said, well, I don't know how many places are here yet, 
But the church I go to, they do teach about heaven, that there is a heaven. They do teach you how to live your life so that you're blessing him, helping people. That's the way you talk to people. You're not, you're not accusing them of anything. I talk to them like they know him. And that's what God said. Talk to them like they already know us. Then they're interested. So in this time, learn how to talk to people. And you know what? The angels standing around you, they're going to help keep you, protect you, especially if you command an army from heaven. That might be new to you too. Don't be afraid by that. We are over the angels. Is that true, everybody? True. Are we going to judge them in days to come? Well, you can't judge somebody that you're under. You need to start thinking about what the Bible says about you. Make a list. Stand in front of a mirror and say it every day. I did that. I did it all the time. And one day Jesus walked in, my wall, in the wall of my home, and he keeps walking in there all the time. It's not impossible for you to go to heaven and see heaven. It's quite wonderful. But I'm not ready to go there. I know people go that cry when they have to leave. I don't cry because I'm not going to leave here without fulfilling everything he wants me to do. And that is to help campaign for this coming election. I'll have, I have a new studio. I'm going to have a broadcast at least once a week. Jump on the Trump 2020 train. Give reports from heaven the whole time. What God is saying. And then you see things happen through the whole election. God has a plan uh, for this country to make it a pattern for other countries' leaders to run after. We just have to love those that don't understand or don't like it. But their lives, even their lives, are better than they were before. Even they are benefiting. I know people who blasted and yelled and hollered, and yet they're small businessmen. They get 25% reduction on their taxes. And they don't say no. They're going to vote for him this time. Because something actually happened during someone's term that did something to help them. Amen? So everybody stand up. We're going to declare something. You don't have to, but you can and then we're going to have some Q&A time. It's hard if I have a Q&A. If I start with Q&A time, I never want to stop. It's hard to stop. So I can stop what I'm talking about so we can have some because people have questions. And it's my, one of my favorite things to do is to answer people's questions. If I know, I'll answer it. If I don't, I'll just say I don't know. Amen? So we're going to declare something. Say, Father. I am your child. I want your will, your way, in my life, and for this earth. So I declare the upcoming election in 2020, the one you have chosen, will win in a landslide. You will show your favor over that administration. And give them new things to do to help our country be greater than it ever was before. And God, because I care, I pray for the other side. The blinders will be taken off their eyes. They will stop hating. They will start loving. That they will benefit from this whole thing. Because this is your plan. And we want your man. So help the others, God. Because we're running our race. Your will. Your way. Hallelujah. We need to shout on that. Everybody, hallelujah. the body of Christ like cat that lays it down I mean 24 years 
because she's heard God and she's not ashamed to proclaim what God has told her, regardless of the persecution she takes. And I know she doesn't say, but it's got to be something else on Facebook and different things and quotes and things that people say. And she is dedicated and committed to her God. And so as we go into the question and answers, we want to take an offering for her and pass offering the offering baskets for her while we're doing this, because this is a fun time. So go ahead and have a seat. And Pastor Brooke, if you and Renato could take these mics so that we can get every question on it so our streamers can hear the question oh, so, she doesn't, awesome. so she doesn't have to repeat it up here. And Father, we just thank you once again, Lord God, for this ministry and this, and this uh, marketplace ministry that's out there, Father, and it's a business. Mm -hmm. Lord God, you have all of that wrapped up in, in this precious one called Cat. And Lord, we thank you for her obedience to do what you've called her to do. And it empowers us. Lord, David and I, as you know, we have been empowered in these last two nights. We've been empowered with a, a new boldness. If that's possible, I don't know what we're going to be like. <laughs> but Father God, we are going into an upgrade. We are all upgrading. So, Lord, we want to bless Cat. We want to bless this ministry. We want it to go out to the outermost parts of the earth. And, Lord, she doesn't even need this money because she's got you. We need to give and we need to support and we need to deposit because, Lord, we're sowing so that we can then benefit, Lord, Amen. in ourselves and Amen. reap, Lord God, so that we upgrade so we can be these fiery lions and lionesses Amen. out there roaring. So, Lord, we just thank you for Amen. leading and guiding our giving tonight. Very good. In Jesus' name. Jesus name. Amen. Uh, crack this mic up, will you? Uh, this is the podium mic. It's off. Oh, is it off? Hit the button. Okay, tell us, tell us how to give, will you? So people, don't, okay, yes. so people understand this. And this is what we're going to do. This is the order we're going to do. On this side, on this side, and on this side, we're going to rotate back and forth. Renato, you'll be on this side. Pastor Brooke, on this side. And what you do, you'll take your questions. We'll, we'll have the questions come up on this side or this side and ask the questions here so we can have the mics so then it'll be clear for the cameras to sell. Got it? Very good. Tell us how to do it. Awesome. And so you can give online at uh, www.gomz.org or uh, on your mobile phone. Text GOMZ to 77977 and you'll see Kat Kerr there. Um, or you can give cash or check. Very good. Very good. All right. Now, the questions, I want to say just a couple of words about the questions. Some people think they don't have one until they hear the first one answered. And then everybody has questions. And I'm a detailed person. That's why God picked me. So most questions have a lot of detail to them. So, and you're going to love every one of them. It doesn't matter. You're going to learn from this Q&A session, but try to keep it to questions about heaven itself, about the spirit realm activities, or about the time we're living in right now, because some people go into, it's not as easy to answer a personal question about yourself, because most of the stuff he gives me is for the corporate body of Christ. So it should be something uh, that everyone here would be interested in or want to know the answer to. It makes it much easier for me because if I answered everybody's personal question, we would literally be here all night long. So try to keep it to something and just one question, okay? Somebody showed up one time. They had 115 questions on the list. I heard from a prophet a long time ago that you are a wise person if a prophet is coming and you want a question, you write it down and hand it to that prophet, put your phone number on it or your email and eventually you'll hear something back. But if you come unprepared, then you're going to go away with whatever God gave them to share when you missed your chance to ask something that you wanted to know. So. Always come prepared, okay? And any of the questions, um, if you don't get to come up here and speak in them, write it on a piece of paper and leave it at the products table with your first name and your age and where you're from because I am literally 
looking for a lot of new questions for book three, and we're going to change out all the ones that are on our website, so we're always looking for new questions, so it's not going to be lost, okay? So let's just get the first question. When the Father asks us to resurrect the ashes, can it be a person that has been in heaven already? This would be somebody who just recently died. Yeah, you're not, we're not bringing, they're not coming anyway. <laughs> somebody been dead, it's been 10 years, do you think they're going to leave heaven? Look, I know you love them, truly, you're a, they're a part of your lives. But if you could go there and see how they were living, you wouldn't ask them to come back. Just be prepared when you go, and you know what's going to happen to get there? Man, no wonder they didn't want to come back down here in their old bodies. So it would normally, this would be somebody who just died, like at a funeral, and you were at the funeral, something like that. Unless one thing, see, this is, how, this is what happens. I was shown in the future an entire plane crashes. Everybody's burned up in the plane like to ashes. And a believer goes and resurrects everybody up that burned up in the plane. They all come back to life. They get their bodies back. They even have their clothes on. That is something that will, be, that will happen. That's like a greater work or manifest its own death. So that could be something like that. But it's usually something that just happened. Okay, so I know that the Lord promotes us on earth as we're faithful, right? So are we going to be continued to be promoted when we're in heaven, into eternity? Um, well, God, I think everybody heard that question, but I'll, I'll kind of say it. God promotes us on the earth, and it says that he's the one who lifts up and puts down. We know he does that, and sometimes even unexpected people, unknown people, he does that. And he's certainly going to do that a lot. Like over the next 20, 30 years, you're going to see that happen a lot down here. God has his ways to reward you when you get to heaven, and you cannot say no to that reward, that reward you'll never forget for the rest of your existence, and that is the main way God rewards you in heaven for all you've done on the earth for him, even things you didn't even think he was aware of, but he doesn't stop rewarding you. So it's not so much like you have to be promoted in heaven. You're already promoted because you move there. The gift he put in you, people will run to see you use that gift. So you, in a way, your whole life changes, whatever your passion is that he put in you to do. With your natural gift, he prepares everything in heaven for you to use that gift. So a lot of people are going to come. They're going to celebrate who you are. They're going to love it. So that way is a, a nonstop promoting of you because of the way he designed heaven. So you're going to love it. You're going to just love it. Kat, has the Lord shown you much about the destiny of New York and Connecticut? I'd like to know better how to pray, and I am from those areas originally. I do know that New York is going to become a region of light in this country. Uh, yes, because of it. And he even explained why. Because they were willing to open their borders to bring all the unwanted, the ones coming to find rescue. New York was very unique for God's purpose for it, and they fulfilled that purpose. That main purpose he had was for them to welcome them in. People came from all over the world, set up their own settlements, and then because some of them became very great people, they went to other places. But New York was like a birthing place for people, for their destinies, for their gifts, and God is planning to honor that. It will become a region of light where one point there'll be no crime, no sin, and no sickness. And I was, I was born in New York, so I also know that. Too. I left heaven and was sent to New York. New York, Yankee. Sent all the way to the deep south. I, I promise to tell people that, okay, if you come to Florida, don't worry about being carried off by an alligator. You probably will never even see an alligator. They don't roam. They're not like the buffalo. They have to stay in the water or their hide will fall off. The only time you see them out of the water is crossing the road to go to another body of water. Their hide is about this thick. And the dinosaurs, even we see how these questions go. The dinosaurs on the earth when it was made the first time, they could not have survived on the earth like it is now. Because those dinosaurs had to stay in continual mist and water. So the atmosphere was like a continual mist. 
The sky was a peachy pink. The sun wasn't there. He lit the original earth with his glory. And they did roam with watcher angels. That's why they find footprints. It's not a human footprint. It's a watcher angel. They had flesh on them. There's a history lesson. Go ahead. What's the next question? <laughs> First of all, I want to say uh, thank you for being the gift and the, re the revelator that you are. Amen. So we love you. Amen. And the other one is, without giving too much away, when do you us to expect your next book? And can you, without giving all of it away, what to expect in the next book? I am working on the next book, but God has a timeline for that. And he says the movie has to come first. Because it'll take one third of my life every year to work in the movie in Hollywood on the movie. And I have to be on this, I have to be there when they do anything because of the spirit realm, they've never seen it. So even though we give them sketches and drawings, they're not quite sure of the activity or the, the words that were spoken at that time, what did the atmosphere feel like. So they have creators who are gonna work on all the spirit realm stuff. I have to be present when that's done. I have to be present when they actually create the sets. I have to be present when they do the filming. And so I'll probably get the weekends off. And that's going to take 18 months just when they get to that part. So I'll be working on and off on book three. It will be three times bigger than... It'll be the last one called Revealing Heaven, number three. So he started a, a, a relationship with you in heaven in book one. And book two in, increases in every level. It shows you more of what's in heaven. Book three is going to show things that will shock you and stun you that's in heaven. It'll, it'll have a picture of a human soul, I can tell you that. Literally how he made your soul, how it operates will be in the book. Uh, even the scene from the third day in hell, I can tell you that will be one of the illustrations. I have 25 illustrations I'm working on. I always do those first. And then he gives me the chapter titles of what to write about because I know so much about it. it it's going to be stunning, uh, eye-opening, and you will celebrate a lot when you see the things that are, that are going to be in that third book. There will even be prophecy at the end about the future. And even some scenes from the future, like one of the planets that will be created when the new earth is made. Amen. So, cool. it's going to be pretty cool. Since we are part of the putting on the third show, like the expansion, the, the powerful first show and second show, can you tell us anything about that that you might know? And one other thing, anything about John F. Kennedy Jr.? Um, I have not seen John F. Kennedy Jr. in heaven. That doesn't mean he's not there. Heaven is bigger than our whole galaxy. It's a planet. It's a world. It's not a flat place. And almost every picture I've seen of heaven, all they can draw is the throne room. They don't know. They know there's a throne room there. So you see a picture of the throne room, right? And usually the father and the son are on the back wall. And there's like a mass of millions of people. I can tell you it's not like that. The throne room is in the middle. The throne is in the middle of the throne room. And there's four sets of steps that go up there so everybody can run up and see them whenever they want to. So that part needs a little correction because he's not on the back wall. Away from everybody, the throne room expands because it's alive. It can hold as many people as he wants to. I can just tell you the third show would be one of the greatest of all because it's what God has purposed from the time we lived in him. And he sent us and took our little spirit man and knit it together in our mother's womb with our flesh body. We can't make a spirit man, people. We can't make anything that is made out of spiritual content. We just can't. That's God's. Right. Only God can do that part. Right. So there is no life until the spirit is attached to that dot of flesh. And we will see so many powerful things. Some of the things I've been talking about even tonight will be part of that third show. But... One of the things I don't talk a lot about is the presence of the glory. The presence of the glory will be so powerful. Most people don't know what the glory is. They know it's probably going to be beautiful. It's going to be amazing. It literally is like carrying the life of God yourself and, uh, and operating it sometimes without measure. Yeah. 
Everyone has a measure. The word talks about us operating in a measure. God gives those measures, but some of the manifested sons of daughters who will be everyday people will operate when they're operating. It will be like without measure. The power will be so tremendous that sometimes it will impact an entire state when something is demonstrated or done. Sometimes it will impact an entire country what will happen. Uh, I know the dead will be raised in mass like thousands at one time by one person and so these are some of the things and this is part of the third show it won't be one day it's not going to be like you know in hell on the third day that was a day in heaven it wasn't just a day space time there's no time in heaven but it it wasn't something he could do if there was time you think about one third of the angels he kicked out along with their leader that probably if there was time would have been a while a long enough for them to have a big party going on the whole time yeah. I'm pretty sure that happened uh, because they were all happy he was kicked out they you think about it heaven was holy it was pure it was undefiled they all love one another they work together you know like brothers did God made tribes of angels for very specific purposes they all knew their their own purpose they were happy about what he made them to do the army was there they had no enemy to fight there was no enemy but God had made an army for the specific person purpose of fighting against the dark army there was no dark army until Lucifer decided to take over they knew who their enemies would be from that point on and so um, I just can tell you this that the, the show is going to be tremendous it will be ongoing probably for several generations which will also shift the way all of our lives will begin to operate for several yeah. generations after that yeah. and I know people have a timeline for the rapture nobody knows that day except the father and he's the one saying this stuff okay he's shown me the next 50 years of my life that doesn't mean it's my last assignment I just know exactly what I'll be doing for the next 50 years what platforms I'll be operating for him and I'm telling you I just started the 50 years so so I can guarantee you I know it's even beyond that time and uh, because it doesn't end until God says it ends amen and even that I think the, the probably the last big show will be the marriage supper of the lamb I've all, also been shown parts of that it's going to be beyond anything you ever imagine it only gets better with God you, you don't lose it's worth anything to be a part of him and what he wants is not worth anything to help hell hell doesn't celebrate anybody they take the worst people who sold themselves literally met with Satan so that really does happen too and lies to them like he did I mean he, he did that in heaven right he did that on the earth he even tried to tempt Jesus to do that he's never changes them all and so he does get people to do all kind of horrific things and he promises them with lies I'll give you power authority I'll give you part of my kingdom you'll rule with me he tortures them worse than anyone else and makes a show of it himself in hell he hates them worse than anybody they get nothing they get worse done to him done to them than anyone else who just rejected Christ it's only worse and bad for them okay so he didn't love anyone don't help him don't advertise for him it's about time we start advertising about the glory of God and the goodness of the earth and the good things that are happening all over this earth because I don't think the fake news understand that or they don't know about it but there are powerful things happening right now in this earth that God is in charge of that are happening about people loving one another countries helping each other and you never see that that's going to change okay next question uh, I always imagine heaven as being the sort of place where everybody can fly around and have super speed and stuff <laughs> so like during the kingdom age does that mean people will be able to do that here I would say since we're all saying on earth as it is in heaven I have to see some of that happening here <laughs> and I'm sure at different times if you need you to why wouldn't you fly I mean why wouldn't you he transported Philip through the sky on a chariot he's not the only one he did that to either 
So why not? Because yes, you do fly in heaven. I, I was taken to a place, and this is, see, this is what rocks people. It's not the fact that they tell them you fly in heaven. It's who teaches you to do that in heaven. That the religious minded, get, they almost like gnash their teeth when I tell them things like this, because they can't see it in their head happening. I was taken to a place in heaven that was this massive amusement park. It's in my first book. It really exists. I've been there several times since then. It has the impossible, impossible, impossible things happening that you have so much fun with doing. And this is the thing. If somebody received Jesus Christ as their Savior as they were dying, they will be in heaven and they will still use the gift God sent them as. So if he sent them doing wonderful, fun things, they have movies in heaven, no defilement, no profane language, no sexuality, no graphic violence. Forget it. You, there's no ratings. They don't need them. But heaven makes ratings for our movies down here. R is rotten. <laughs> PG-13, partly good 13% of the time. PG, partly good. G, mostly good. So remember that when you go to watch a movie. Um, Superman teaches you how to fly. Huh? Christopher Reeves. <laughs> Christopher Reeves teaches you to fly. You think about the humor and all that. Because they have a place where you actually learn. You don't just jump up and do it. There's things you have to learn in heaven. There's things just given to you and you do it. But he wants you to discover things. I mean, he's our father. Like, you want your kids to discover things and then you do them. How wonderful does that make you feel? Well, it's no different in heaven. So they have a place in heaven where you can go. And they have stands for all your friends and family to come watch you learn to fly. It doesn't work out the first time. There's more laughter in heaven than anything in this earth. Yeah. And people invite their friends on purpose to learn because they know they're going to have a mini show right there. <laughs> so everybody's friends and family are waiting because they've already learned, right? They can just stream. They have the beginner's area. God's smart. You could hit each other and it wouldn't hurt, but why, right? So they have the beginner's area where you learn basic instructions on flying then you have the intermediate area then you have wherever you want to go in heaven so this is the basic area where the beginners learn and most of them get out there and they try to fly <laughs> this is one thing i've seen them doing they're trying to fly across the air that doesn't work sometimes they look like they're rowing a boat i don't know what they're doing <laughs> and some of them just throw themselves out there and they spin yeah. spin 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 but your instructor will stop you. <laughs> and eventually you learn. Now this is very, isn't this just like righteous, right? <laughs> you better learn to laugh. Yeah. There's a lot to laugh at and sometimes it's you. Yeah. But yes, you will fly in heaven. So why not down here? You never know what he's going to do with you. I walked on air. I didn't expect that. Right. I've been talking about it. I stepped right off and just kept walking. Yep. And so I was just doing what was normal and it became super naturally heaven normal. So what's the next question? So I have a lot of visions of the kingdom of God and a lot of it's similar. I'm walking up step. Jesus gives me the keys and open the door and I see a lot of rooms. I see a lot of items he wants me to take. Does that actually change this 3D realm? I mean, what's the point of all of that? Are you talking about while you're on the earth? You're talking about while you're in right heaven. Now, if I see the kingdom of God and I have a vision and, the, and Jesus gives me something, what's the whole point to that? There's a point to it. I'm sure he's got a point. I don't always know the point, but it's the same thing that how he operates with me. He'll show me something and it might be years later and then I do it. That doesn't mean he's not going to let you do it. Because he has timing for everything. He has times he reveals things. That's what he's doing. Then there's times he activates it. 
of uh, something you do or an event that's going to happen, he will activate it, and then you will actually do it. And there will be, there are places built on this earth in spiritual areas where because of what we're doing and who we are during this time, we will have access to those places and do things. And that's probably what he was showing you. That was awesome. I just want to thank you, first of all, for supporting our great president, because the fake yeah. news lies about him all the time, and I thank you for doing that. Yeah. Amen. Thank you. And also, I want to also thank you that in 2009, my husband and I lost our youngest son to an accident. You came here a few months later, your first time here in 2010, mm -hmm. and you, you actually said a portal opened up above the ceiling here, and you, you described him. You saw yeah. him hanging by his legs off the portal. Yes. I want to thank you for that because... Was his name Luke? Yes, it was. And the, fir <laughs> and the, the first time I heard you speak before you said that, I mm -hmm. was, you know, my, my flesh was like, what is she talking about? I mean, of course I believed in heaven, but we believe for his bodily resurrection here and it didn't yes. happen. And I know you said just a while ago that that would not happen because he doesn't want to come he back here. He would not... As right. much as he loves you, this is how they feel in heaven. They don't, they don't feel like us. They have no sorrow. They have no grief. There isn't any in heaven. They celebrate knowing one day you're going to be there with them, and their whole focus is you being there. And to them, it's not like 10 years have gone by. They don't even think time-wise like, like we would on the earth. So all I can tell you is he still feels the same way. He's still having an awesome time, and he is watching this meeting. And, and my question for you is, as far as I know you spoke about atheism last night, mm -hmm. you said that all people have God in them. He put that in them. And my father is an atheist. I've been praying for him for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And my question is, can I command the host of heaven to go and save him? Because I just spoke to him on Father's Day and nothing's changed. Don't go by what any, anything you're hearing or seeing. Do not go by what the evidence is in the natural. You have to believe what God's word promises you, okay? He promises you. He says, if you believe in something, say it, and you do not doubt in your heart, you shall have what? Whatsoever you say. So don't change what you're saying. Don't change it, okay? That's the best encouragement I can give you. Okay, this is a question I've been wanting to ask you for a while. Um, in heaven, there's no sin. And so uh, the scripture has kind of puzzled me um, where, where it says, if you don't forgive, neither will you be forgiven. And so if you're a Christian and there's somebody you hadn't forgiven, how does that work? <laughs> there's a big difference in being angry and upset and for unforgiveness consuming you. Unforgiveness is like a spirit that consumes you. Just being angry and upset for somebody and you don't want to say, you know, it's okay. There's a big difference. God is the only one who can judge that. He's not turning people away because they, they had a reason to be angry or upset. And you don't want to speak to somebody or if you think about them, you, it hurts you inside. It's more you losing stuff from your soul. Loose all, that, all the trauma, whatever you experienced from them, whatever they said to you, or did you need to loose that from your soul? And the reason for that is you won't think about it no more. Because sometimes we're hurting worse, holding back from something, than the person who actually did something to us. And, and let me tell you, if they make it to heaven, they will not remember that. People don't remember those things. When they get to heaven, they love you no matter who you are. And they don't want anyone suffering over something they caused to happen on the earth or something someone on the earth did to them. Because that is what Satan will do. He will take whatever caused you to feel that way and he will ram it down you every day. And he will make the, that, um, that block longer and bigger he'll cause that division between you to be stronger if you let him do that so God says look at what's happening to you and deal with that first because when that's dealt with with you it will be, be very easy one day for you to say I'm just going to let it go and I'm going to forgive him but the more you dwell on it and meditate on those things it will get stronger have a stronger hold on you so in God even said the, the person who's carrying that, the per person who's carrying that in them is because they're suffering from something, and yet the person who caused it probably isn't even thinking about it anymore, 
or maybe they are, maybe they're just being hateful to you, but their freedom comes when your freedom comes. So don't let that be something that consumes you or wrecks your life or your destiny because that happened to you. Don't carry it. You loose it. What you loose on earth, they will loose in heaven and you will get to a place where it doesn't even affect you. Then you can say this, even though I don't feel like this in my flesh, I choose as an act of my will to forgive that person. And that way your emotions are not even involved. Hi, Kat. Hey. I just want to thank you, first of all, for your first book. Uh, I took that book to Venezuela after my mother passed away. And everybody got set free from grieving. Oh, yay. And yes, and from depression. They were so sad after they read your book. Because I told them, this is what's true. Well, my question tonight is, uh, I'm originally from Venezuela. I've been here 40 years. Mm -hmm. Has the Lord shown you anything about the evil government being In Venezuela? removed Absolutely. anytime soon? Absolutely. He has shown. He's talked to me about Venezuela. And actually, I was having an event in Orlando, and a woman came all the way from Venezuela, right when it started, brought me the Venezuelan flag. And said, I'm giving you to this to take before the courts of heaven and before the Father himself to bring a resolution for our country so that it can be free. So the people who want to serve you there will be free to serve you. And God said, I will do it. And God said, it only takes one person sometimes to move his heart and in this woman came for only that reason all the way from that country with that flag so God would be able to do something because of her words and what she declared and she was from there he cannot reject or let her words drop to the ground so and you will see something major happen in and Venezuela when you said you will have what you say that's what I've been doing I've Good. been declaring the Venezuela is free and I tell my family Good. we will be set free by the word of God the power of God amen I would like to say uh, one more thing about um, the woman who talked about unforgiveness, um, especially, especially if something happened between you and a loved one. I started to start to talk about that, then I didn't finish it. No matter what relationship you had here, if that person goes to heaven, they will have more love for you than they ever had down here on this earth. Love you cannot even understand in your mind right now. You cannot conceive of the love of God living inside of somebody who has hope for you, who is declaring over you, that's asking God to bless you, even if they didn't treat you right when they were here. If they died suddenly and you were not expecting it, they understand, God understands sometimes that can create a wound in you. Don't let that wound be there. That person is having the time of their life. They're not just existing. They're living. They live in his love. They're filled with his life. And the greatest thing they would ever want for you is for you to complete your destiny. They may, their destiny may be finished in heaven sometimes. Some people don't realize that. I've even seen young people who were raised up here on this earth, and when they got to heaven, they finished their destiny. So even young people don't miss that. And, and you may hard, have a hard time understanding that, but God still has plans for children or for people, and they have a destiny. Their ultimate destiny in heaven is to be that gift, whether it's to run a golf course or a fishery or a, a, a carnival or a, you know, a, a rodeo, uh, have a line of bakeries in heaven. Whatever that gift was they never got to use on the earth, they will still use that in heaven. But the thing that I notice the most when I'm there is how much love people have. I feel waves of it coming from the people. These are the ones who've moved home to heaven and how much they care about their family members. And they're declaring over every member of their family, not just one of them. So something great happens on the inside of them when they stand before the one that they came from. And the Lord escorts them up the steps of the throne and gives them literally back to the Father. They know they are home, and they know that's who sent them to that earth. Amen. So I want to encourage anybody 
If you've lost somebody recently, they're never going to forget you. They're not going to replace you. No one can ever replace you on this earth. But in case you wondered, it's okay to love again, and that may not be the right time to tell you, but you just need to know that one day that may happen, and whoever's in heaven that loves you is not going to be angry at you if you have someone to love. They're probably asking God to send you someone to love. Yeah, right. And this is the point. When you get home, you're not married to anybody. That means you can still have them as your best friend. And so that your relationship, if you were married on the earth, you're a little bit closer together as best friends and other people that weren't. So it's not like that relationship is gone. You're just not married for a reason. And this is the reason, and it's a really good reason. The reason we go home and we're not married when we get there, we come home as the father's son or daughter. You live right next to the people that you were married to. You'll be best friends. But there's a legitimate reason because we can only have one bridegroom. It would not be right. And the Holy Spirit gave me this revelation just a couple weeks ago. Somebody was asking me about that. And I said, well, I think there's probably a good reason why you're not married. And so I was told, this is why you were not married. There's going to be a marriage in heaven. And there can only be one bridegroom. And that bridegroom is for both. Male and female, we will be the bride of Christ. You can't be married to someone else. It wouldn't be right. Yeah, that's very good. That was revelatory. That is. That was very revelatory. And so now when people say, ask me, well, how come I can't be married? I said, because you already have a marriage waiting on you in heaven. And we are all betrothed to one person, and his name is Jesus Christ. And no matter how you feel about each other here, when you get there, you will love him more than anyone in existence. So, there's only one bridegroom. <laughs> and one bride, and we're it. So maybe, well, I don't know what time it is. We'll probably have time to take a couple more. Oh, who's next? Okay. Other than being in the presence of the Most High God and Jesus Christ, the what was your most memorable and transformational experience that you took from heaven? In this? heaven? It's, it's, it's hard to talk about that. There's probably more than one. Uh, one was when I was caught up to heaven. I don't remember which, what time that was, what, what number that was. I gave up after about a thousand times. I stopped counting. But I remember very clearly every time I've gone. But the one that impacted me the most because I'd seen Jesus many times on the earth. It doesn't mean I'm familiar with him. I'm still overwhelmed and undone. But this was with the Father. Because I knew he loved everybody. People picture him super glued to the throne. They think he can never leave it. That's ridiculous. Okay? He goes all over heaven. He shares time with everybody in heaven. But he has his own special place. He takes you to. And it says... Uh, it talks about in the word where it says that in all you're getting of knowledge, get understanding. And it says that is knowledge of the Holy One. That's the Father. So that's why he, you hear me talk so much about the Father. Jesus said, I want you to introduce the Father to the earth. Let them know about his love, what he thinks about them, how they lived before they were here. So they'll understand and love him like they do me. Because there's a lot about Jesus in the Word. People have had encounters with Jesus everywhere. Not so much with the Father. But in this time, he wants us to know him. So he caught me up one time. When he catches me up to have him, I'm always eight years old. So that's why I remember things. It's real easy to remember. That's why he doesn't give me things. He doesn't use long words even when he speaks to me up there. He speaks to me like I'm a real child. I have pigtails, and I'm very excited when I run up there. I want to run up and sit on his lap so he can hold me because I understand he is my, my father. He, he is our father. And I love the scripture that says, Abba, Father, you know, or Daddy, however you want to look at it. When you get there, that's how you're going to think about him. He caught me up one time, but it wasn't to the throne. He took me by my hand, and this is the thing about God. He can be 150 foot tall if he wants to be. He can be as big as this earth if he wants to be. He's big. Okay? He can hold anyone in his arms, no matter how big you are here. Uh, you're not so big that he can't hold you in his arms, but he can also make himself smaller so he can walk right next to you. 
So here I'm a little girl with pigtails. I'm looking up at him. His hair is filled with life. It's white. It's just beautiful. It's glowing. His eyes have flames of fire, blue flames of fire. And he's got the most gentlest spirit. I tell people Jesus is the warring one. Jesus is the warring king, trust me. But the father has such love in him because of his son. Before his son, you know, he would pour out his wrath on the earth. Remember that? He wiped it out. Remember when he did that? He's not like that anymore because of what his son paid for. He's love itself. Yeah. Kindness itself. And he took my hand. I've been doing this probably for several years. He took my hand. He said, come, I'm going to take you into my chamber. And it said on it, chamber of understanding. And it was this place like this massive gemstone, a huge massive gemstone, because you have to remember the stones of fire are in him. Well, he has one that's his own special place that he takes people to, especially when they come home to heaven, so he can get to know you better. And so I walked in there, I wasn't afraid of anything, and then it was this whirlwind of the dark glory. And it says I hide myself in the dark, remember the dark clouds of glory? It looks like a million peacock feathers with eyes in them, with real eyes. And that's what he sometimes will hide himself in. And, but when I stepped in there with him, they were gone. It was this beautiful place. Now, it wasn't massive outside, but inside it was like, it looked like it went forever. And he looked at me and said, where would you like to go? And I said, well, I want to be right here with you. I don't need to go anywhere. He said, I can take you to the future. I can show you the new earth. I can show you things to come. I went, no, I, no, I, just, I want to be here with you. I, 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 I want to be here with you. I don't need to go anywhere else. He goes, I can take you to the past. I can show you heaven before Lucifer fell. I can show you before the earth was made. Don't you want to go? And I said, no. Right here is where my heart is. My heart is for you. My heart is to do your will. You loved me before I came enough to send your son that you love so much that even at one point you had to turn your very back on him because of he had to take all the evil. And, and I'm just a little girl saying this to him. And he reaches down, picks me up, and goes, that's why I love you so much. Because you want to be just like me. And there's no greater place anyone could ever desire to be than to be with me. And so I know it blessed his heart so much. That's why I remember it so clearly that it was burned in me. And I can't see him any other way. I can't see him as a God of wrath. I can't see him as a God of anger or vengeance or uh, wanting to pour something up on you. If he was willing to give the most precious thing he had for us before even while we were yet sinners, he sent his precious son, who was everything. They did everything together before he even became Jesus. When he was the word, they created together. They went everywhere together. And he was willing to send them. You know why? So we could come back to him. That's how much he loves people. He loves them. That's why he is long-suffering. That's why he said he doesn't even want the vilest sinner set free. But we have to make a choice. He won't force people to take him. And I know right now there's people preaching that God's going to restore all things, and they throw in that. When they say that, they literally mean everything. He's going to not make a new earth. He's going to restore this one. He's going to forgive Satan. He's going to forgive the fallen angels. He's going to make it like it never happened. That is not what he said. And I would just say what he said to me. He said, I cannot allow things to come to this holy place. He said, I gave my son. I'm not keeping you out of heaven. I'm making a way for you to come to heaven because I am not allowing or permitting evil, wickedness, sin to come back into this place again and pollute it. I can't do it. So I'm not doing something to keep you out. I did something to let you come in. But you have to make that choice. He says, so people who say a loving God wouldn't send people to hell, I don't. I make a way so they don't have to go there. But they will choose their self where they will live. So he is a loving God. But he doesn't want, you wouldn't want, he said, if I let everyone on earth, whoever existed, to come to heaven, then heaven would be just like the earth. 
And that is not going to happen. You would not want that to happen yourself. So unfortunately, there are people in hell. I have been to hell. He won't let me talk about it because he's still introducing heaven. It's real. It's worse than you ever dreamed. Like heaven is greater, more abusive than you ever uh, dreamed. Uh, Satan loves nobody. Why give yourself? I'm not willing. So I pray that you won't be willing. And you will learn to forgive and you will learn to. But this is the thing. You can share love. Love is the greatest thing he ever made. But love includes truth. I used to say you can't give love and not give truth because you're not really loving. But actually, it's part of it. So if you love, you have to share the truth. Amen? So don't leave it out somewhere. And just only share love. He'll love people all the way to hell. Because they're choosing that. Love is a wonderful way to show them you care and he cares. But you can't leave out the truth. Amen? Amen. So, any more questions? Oh, yep. she has a question from Facebook. I have a question now. Oh, let her answer her question. Yes. Uh, we're, we want to know what God wants to do for... Colorado, and we were battling hell here, and we need help from heaven to overcome the fifth chair. I do know that, and so does God. He's not ignorant to anything, and Colorado is also going to be a region of light. Yes. Yes. And let me tell you what, the people sitting in this room have authority enough to do that. Yes. You don't need to look to heaven to bring a lightning bolt down here. Yes. Strike someone dead that you don't like who is in office. It's your authority taking over the evil, the demonic that is ruling, that is controlling those people. That's why we were given an army. They will bombard continually, send them continually to wherever that person sits, whatever their title is, send them against the demonic controlling them. I will also add this. We're living in a time where if they won't yield, God will take them from the earth. That would be his last choice. But because of this time we're in that he calls holy and powerful for us, he wants us, especially if it's a place he calls his own. And I'm, I don't know why he, uh, some would be regions of light, probably because of who will choose to live in those places. Regions of, regions of darkness, i am talked too fast. Regions of darkness will exist because people want them. Right. And the regions of light will begin to produce the glory of God. And those people will run from those places because they so want the evil. They so want to live that way. They want that lifestyle. They will not be able to live in a place for God. The glory of God is powerful. And the reason it's powerful is because you're carrying it. Amen. It's not a great wave yeah. coming from heaven to sit on a place. It will be in us. Christ in us is the hope of glory. That glory will become a region in places in the earth. So what you do is begin to live more like God, declare like him, hear him, come against any evil entities, spiritual entities, and they will begin to be driven out. And then the influence they had over those people will be gone, and fear will fall on those people who are leading. That's how it works. So it's in you. And the way you live your life and what you say and, and how you operate is what will change things in this earth. Amen. Okay. We're going to let somebody online ask a question. You got the mic, John. <laughs> I have the microphone. Um, I wasn't going to ask any of these questions. I told them on Facebook that I was screen sh taking screenshots of them to save them for a future podcast. But um, this one needs to be answered <laughs> and I know you've talked about this before but it's kind of a two-part question the first part she said can a believer who commits suicide go to heaven and the reason she asked is because um, Judas had committed suicide in the Bible but a young girl said that she saw him in heaven I don't know who the young girl was but he is in hell 
And even Jesus himself said that he did not remain with him. Number one, Judas was never a true believer. He fought against everything Jesus did. He wanted Jesus to take over the world so he would benefit from it. He did not have any love for him at all. And he gave himself to Satan. He never repented for what he did. He went out for the guilt he had. He hung himself. Judas is, is in hell. And Jesus said, Father, I have all those that you gave me, save the son of perdition. He did not have him because he was in hell. Well, I can answer the other part of that question, why she probably thought she saw him. There is a mock heaven and a mock hell. There are things that are built in the spirit realm. There's, they're all around you. Uh, a lot of them are built by heaven, and heaven uses them when the angels are sent on assignment. There's also some built by hell, not very well. None of their stuff looks very good, but they have places for the, the demons to gather and, and infiltrate places and stuff like that. And they have built to bring confusion to the body because the Father's catching so many people up to heaven and so many people down to hell. Satan always does something to try to stop it, bring confusion, or counteract it. So it would look like somebody's not telling the truth. And one of those places is a mock hell. And... This is the thing about the enemy. When he thinks he's winning, he gets very sloppy, and then he becomes not intelligent, and then he'll show people. He'll, this is the thing. You have to test spirits. If an angel comes up to you and said, I'm here to take you somewhere, you have to say, are you from the spirit of the most high God who sent his son to die? It's very simple. You ask them that. They can't lie. There's no way they can lie. They will disappear or they'll say nothing to you, but most people just go with them. And if you go, that means you're open to be shown whatever. If it's not an angel, there's still demons that can have a measure of light in them. Not every one of them look like defiled, horrible, ugly things. So if people don't ask, like someone, a leader in the body, was caught up by supposed aliens to, be, to Saturn, to the rings of Saturn, this actually happened, and they didn't test them. So they went to the rings of Saturn, by these demons who said they were aliens and they gave them higher enlightenment to know about the gods of the Egyptians. And now they have rejected De Jesus Christ. They, they, everything, rejected everything about him, said they now serve the God of the Egyptians. That's why you have to test spirits. So that was not real Saturn, by the way. That was a mock place made in the spirit realm to look like that. Um, and I, I'm not in line, but it goes in line with this. And okay. it's just something that is just very... Right now, it's really um, critical because <laughs> a lot of people are talking about this. The ascension movement where they get in groups and as an act of their will, they are all group lifted to what they say is heaven. Could they be actually going to a mock realm that is, is a counterfeit? Since I've never been a part of that group, I know things like that happen. And there's always the chance of that happening if you don't have the opportunity to question who is taking you. I do know that people are doing that. I know some people, God has commissioned to do that. There's some people who decide in their own soul to do it their self. That is not wise. Uh, because we do within us the way God made us. We do have different authorities within us. We have abilities to command and speak to things. And that's how a lot of people got caught in the New Age movement years ago. Now people are caught into all kinds of things and they don't understand it's not God. Because this is the thing. If they have a real encounter, that's the point they make. I had a real encounter. I went, a lot of people have real encounters. But where did you go? And who took you there? That's how Satan gets away with these mock places. And he's caught all kinds of people to the mock heaven. And they all meet Mother Mary, who is ruling there. There's always some kind of a thing that gives you a hint something's not right. Always. Because I've heard of many encounters people have. And there's always a measure of something that is not truth. Uh, people are caught to the mock hell. They're shown children in hell. That is absolutely a lie. There are no children in hell. These people have also seen uh, and talked with Mother Mary in heaven. 
That is not true. She does not call herself that. She is Mary who bore Jesus, but she worships Jesus Christ as her own Savior. And then more encounters started building and building. Satan took a lot of people to hell because he enjoyed it. And it wasn't even the real hell. Because if they had been to the real hell, they'd still be screaming. They wouldn't act like it was so nonchalant. Well, I saw Christians there, and I was told they were in hell because they wore blue jeans. How many people got blue jeans on them? And then they were told that the Christians were in hell because they had colored highlights in their hair. And then somebody else was taken to the mock hell, and they were said, they're always told these are Christians. These are Christians because they wore jewelry. The horrible part about it is these people believe it because they were literally taken by a spiritual being through the spirit realm to a place that to them was literally real. So that's why it's, you need an understanding of the spirit realm. You need to understand what that place is. It's the original realm that God made. It was made before the physical realm in order to make this physical planet. He had to take like a canvas, the physical realm, and stretch it around part of the spiritual realm so he could hang all the planets in the sky so we would have a place to live and have physical body. So this stuff happens, but Satan still has powers. I mean, he'll do anything he can to lie to people. Uh, if he can get them to, to be deceived and they say yes, then they can be taken to places and he'll say, uh, as an angel of light, this is now your assignment. You to go all over this world and share this truth. And it's a lie. So it's bringing confusion to the body because people thought, well, I thought, I thought you couldn't fake anything. Well, if you believe the father of lies and he's the one who created the lie, yes. But there's a way not to be deceived, okay? Number one, don't run after things that you're not aware of or how to operate in those places. God gives you commissions. If an angel really came from him and was supposed to take you, you can ask that angel. If he says, yes, I was sent by the Most High, then you should certainly go. But, but this is happening everywhere. And I've even seen some people on shows talking about their experiences in hell, and they didn't go to the real hell. They didn't go to the real heaven. Okay, they never talk about the glory, the splendor, the love of God. They always talk about uh, people who would not. I've heard them talk about people that wouldn't be in heaven. I've also talked to them about people who they say are in hell and are not in hell. So you have to know who's sharing. And you have to know yourself how to discern the spirit. And so if anything comes to you and says you're supposed to go with me, you would do if it was a person, wouldn't it? I mean, if some stranger came to your door and said, you're supposed to go with me, I'm going to take you so-and-so, we're going to go to the White House, go to that. would you go with that person? I hope not. Well, there's no difference in the spirit realm. So you just have to know who is talking to you, and if they have the right to talk to you, you always have the right to refuse. And if you refuse and it's God, and you've tested him, they said, yes, I'm from God, and you don't go, he'll probably give you another chance somewhere down the line to go. So, yes, yes, and Satan in the in the days coming, one of the one of the um, there's we know there's signs and wonders, but there'll be unholy signs and wonders. Uh, it talks about them in the Bible too. And this is the thing: he will heal people. They'll actually have witches. Don't trust a witch. Don't watch witchcraft. Don't read witchcraft. Have nothing to do with witchcraft. Witchcraft is real. It was real back in the day of Jesus. It is still real now. And none of it is good. None of it. It is the most controlling thing you can get involved with. And you will be deceived over and over again. And that's not a good thing. And this is what Satan will do. He'll have, because people be having miracles everywhere, right? So Satan will have his own in the park. And they'll say, these witches will say, come and join us. We're a good coven. We love people. We can heal you. Do you have something that needs to be healed? And they'll heal them in front of everybody. All Satan has to do is remove the disease that he put there. And it will be a mock healing 
just to bring deception to people. So we're a little ways away from that happening, but as much as you can get understanding on, the better you're prepared. But I will just say this to you. Uh, Satan has used Harry Potter for years to introduce witchcraft as being good. If you read it, loose it from your soul. If you have it, get rid of it. If your kids watch it, lay their hands on it and loose it from their soul because uh, the, the author hates Christians. And they literally practice witchcraft. And that book, I've never read it, but people tell me stuff in it. Some of those acts that they do in those books, and now they, they sell spell kits, is real witchcraft. There's even a Harry Potter University being built in Richmond, Virginia. And guess how many people will probably send their kids there? Because it's a fantasy, they think. It's not a fantasy. Nothing from hell is a fantasy. Amen? So there's always, there's always good stuff to share with you, powerful stuff to share with you. But, but if you can receive a warning that will save you a lot of stuff later in your life, then just receive it. Because I do know, I've been a seer since I was a little girl, and I saw operations of hell everywhere. I know what they do to trick people, mark people, follow people. So when you sin, you get marked by the enemy, then they follow you and try to get you to fall again. So nothing's being hidden. There's an unseen world that sees you all the time, okay? So live upright, righteous, get rid of the junk, yep. get rid of it. It'll be like it was never there. Enemy will have no way to, to track you or find you, and he should have nothing to do with you, no right to do anything to you. And you can say that too, but the good news is this. We're entering into a time where you have to understand the more of God, the spirit realm around you, which has always been here. I see beings operating everywhere all the time, even here, when I've been present in the hotel, outside the hotel, everywhere I go. I see activities. I am purpose sometimes will say something to the demons because they don't think you can see them. I make sure. They know who I believe. Then I ask the host to go attack them. Then they run screaming down the street. The host is just falling behind them, whacking them with their sword, you know, crushing them. Yeah. And so I, I wreak havoc wherever I go. Good. That's good. And there are kids doing it right now. Yeah. Their children will be raised in this time to begin to know. We find out about the glory. We will get to carry the glory. But our kids will live in the glory. And their kids will know nothing but the glory, which is why God needs generations on the earth. When he starts something new, he needs generations in order for it to operate. So I can say, uh, if you're young, you have a, a long, powerful life ahead of you. And if you're not young, ask to be timeless and get ready to live longer because you have a decision to make for God. Uh, you don't have to be bound by time, even now, if you choose not to. So this is a great time to be on the earth. I think we'll probably take one more, one more question. Does he have a question? Oh, I want to hear his question. Well, I'll, I'll ask it for him. Okay. Um, he was curious to know uh, if you could describe what heaven looks like. Specifically, he was wondering, is it bright? Is it yellow? Uh, is it golden? But if you could maybe describe its characteristics, landscapes. Just so I, I can share in a few minutes, but I've seen so much of it. It is all light. There's no darkness in heaven. Nobody ever sleeps because they never get tired. They have rainbow bridges. They have aragons that you can fly on. They have dinosaurs you can ride on. They have fountains filled with chocolate and homes made out of jello you can eat. Uh, they have a fantastic, you can go into Cartoon Village and write a cartoon out and then you go in it and you are it. Okay, this is heaven. This is really heaven. They have rodeos. They have, uh, they have a, uh, they have hunting, but you do it with a camera. The point is this. When you hunt, the creature you're looking for, a supernatural spiritual being, it will get you before you ever get it. You go back to the clubhouse, and there's your face plastered on a 40-foot screen because the creature you're looking for got you first. They celebrate Christmas in heaven, everybody. We'll end with this one. Who is it? Oh, the friendly forest. There is a friendly forest where the trees talk 
and they will sing and dance with you. Even the stones, little stones, pebbles, jump up and down with faces, and they sing glories to God. The tree can uproot itself and go to your mansion and root itself and be a friend and talk and have conversations with you. I've seen all of this in heaven. My sister Jen is writing children's books that will show a lot of these scenes in heaven for children will know the truth about heaven and our Lord and the Father and the angels. Angels are made out of everything. Uh, they don't all look like us. Probably half of them don't. Half are creatures. They're very fierce. They're the army. They have weapons coming out of them. Uh, so trust me, the army that protects us is to hell terrifying. The glory of God is everywhere. Father sends a wave of his rainbow through heaven to look for you and bring you back to himself in the throne room. Uh, you never want to leave there. They, celebra they have celebrations in the throne room where it's like a big party. They like celebrations. Uh, sometimes worship is just jumping up and down and screaming, you know, like they do here on this earth that came from heaven. It all creates glory for God. It's worship for God. Angels love to crowd surf at some of the concerts they have in heaven. <laughs> They're real beings. They have personalities. They care very much for us. God made them for us. That They're not against you. Amen? Amen. Any other questions? <laughs> oh, I have to answer that one. Asked, she was asking about if anybody commits suicide, did they go to heaven? It depends on if it's actually suicide or not. I was caught up by the Father on purpose. I was going to go to Pennsylvania. And he said, I'm going to have you bust a myth that's been around for a long time that people cannot take their life and go to heaven. He said, that depends on if it's suicide or not. He said, go look up the word suicide in the dictionary. Sometimes he asked me to do it. And it says someone who willingly, knowingly, intelligently, in the right mind, decide they're going to end their life, usually is to hurt people like terrorists like terrorist bombers they on purpose choose to no longer live they do it usually for a horrible purpose but what most people are doing aren't ending their life they're ending their suffering and God says I judge and then after he said that he took me three times to heaven people who had ended their suffering but loved Jesus Christ they all three were in heaven uh, they did not want to stop living. They loved their families, but they saw no other escape. The pain was so great. They, some of them, one had mental issues, one had medical issues, one had emotional issues, and, and most of the time, one of it was from medicine that was given them to heal them. It gave them uh, trauma and continual suicidal thoughts, flooded them, and they thought, I can't handle this anymore. I'm going home to Jesus, and they ended their suffering. And God said, I don't want everyone thinking their loved ones who knew me, who believed in me, who trusted me, uh, even if they fell for some reason, but they never gave me up or quit loving me and something happened and their life ended, they are not in hell. He said, I would be an unjust God if I took somebody who loved me and served me and they had an accident and something happened physically to their head that they weren't thinking right. All they knew was pain and agony, and they couldn't live. They couldn't handle the suffering. Or the thing with the medicine, that actually happens a lot. They even have things on bottles that say it could give you suicidal thoughts. And so God said, I'm going to make sure you understand this. So he put despair on me. Despair is what comes right before suicide. And you begin to have those thoughts. He made me carry it for a week and tell nobody. And all I could think in my head, it was like I was literally experiencing it. There was no, I felt no hope. And this is, and I knew him. There was no hope in my mind that this would ever end. All I could think of was I'm getting out of here. I can't bear to be here. This is so great. I, I wanted to be taken. He wouldn't take it from me. He told me first. He said, I will not take it off of you. At the end of the week, I will take it off of you, and you will never forget what that felt like, and you will understand why people cannot take the agony or the suffering of that bombarding them all the time. And it was horrible. At the end of the week, psh, it was like it never happened. I went, oh, I'm going to go share that message everywhere. And after that, I went to Pennsylvania for the first time and shared that message, and I found out several people in the meeting had had loved ones who had done that. They all ran down front. They were crying. They were hanging on to me. And uh, there was even a well-known person, I won't mention their name, that um, their son took his life, his, uh, ended his suffering, 
and he had been in an accident, a well-known person. And so this young man had served God his whole life. He was like in his late 20s, loved Jesus. But all he kept saying was, I can't handle this. He'd been in an accident. They gave him this medicine. They took him off the medicine. They had to put him back on the medicine. And he finally said, I, I can't. I'm leaving. I'm leaving. He kept telling them, I'm leaving. And then they found him, and he was dead. And God, and he was coming to our city to speak. And God said, his wife is hiding herself. The mother is hiding herself because of all the believers saying, it's too bad your son is burning in hell. The world didn't say that. The world, this is the awful part. The world said, we're so sorry for your loss. You know, we want to help console you. We want to comfort you. This is the world. But the ones in the body were saying instantly he was burning in hell. So she hid. She wouldn't come out. She wouldn't go anywhere. She didn't want her face to be seen. And she was grieving already, right? And God said, I'm not I'm tolerating this. I'm going to let them know exactly what their son is doing. He caught me up to heaven. I saw their son. I didn't really know about them. And I was taken to the, his father's mansion because this man was young. And I was taken to his father's, literally his father's mansion being built in heaven. And it had this great mantle. It was at the foot of the mountain of spices. And it was absolutely beautiful. And that's where he was staying at that time. And there was a trophy on the mantle that said, Satan, zero, God, one. And it was, he was saying that Satan did not get their son. Then it was walked through the mansion. I saw siblings that weren't even born yet in photographs in this person's mansion and then i saw the son another time he was packing up a horse he was going to go up the mountain of spices to go do a hunt and he said i wish my dad knew there's a new way to shoot animals that won't hurt them and he was packing camera gear so this is how i found out about the hunting and he was going up into these woods to go hunting and he said man i remember all the fun i had with my dad and my brothers when we did this but it's even better now and so i saw these creatures hunting behind the trees i'm sure there were some of the ones he was going to try to get i saw him stop by the clubhouse and register that he was going on this hunt so if he if, he, if his scope got the picture that it would be put up there your picture okay is in the, in, the, in the corner, the one who took the picture, the one they captured is on the screen. <laughs> Most of the time, the creature's here and you're up there on the screen. So all that was happening and I wrote three pages, three days in a row, God took me to heaven and showed me the sun. I was also taken into his mother's mansion, which was right next door. Had the name of the family over this part because they were like, I call them like, like community or family mansions, like you live in a whole wing of your own. This wing could be like 50,000, 100,000 square feet. It could be half the size of a city because God's gracious. And so I typed all this up. He was coming to speak. I took it to my pastor and said, I got this word. He read it. He was crying. He goes, you make sure he gets that word. They are suffering so much. He said, I'm in agreement with this word. That hit their sons. It changed him forever. It changed him. His mom came out of hiding. She was filled with joy and celebration. The father was weeping to know that God cared enough to show that his son, where his son was. I didn't know where they lived. They lived at the big mountains, at the bottom of the big mountains in Colorado. And so he said, that's why I made their mansions there, because I knew they would love it. And he said, and, and, and this person said, we went hunting. I took my sons hunting all the time. Well, it wasn't really to kill something as much as it was to have the experience of being together. And then all these things I saw was exactly the way they lived their life. Things he said himself for his mother. Uh, I saw him wearing plaid, like this plaid shirt and jeans. And that was exactly what he was wearing when they found him. So every, over and over again, uh, I saw things that just confirmed to them that their son was in heaven. Amen. So good. Very good. Very good. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Uh, thank you, Kat. Thank you.